I saw uh, Father James Martin uh, post something on Facebook recently. Um, Father Martin is a Jesuit, and he's uh, pretty liberal. He's kind of been the poster child of taking up the social, the Christian version of, of social justice warrior. And the article that he posted was about a homosexual woman uh, who was fired uh, from a papist school because she married her girlfriend. And uh, as I read his commentary on the article, it occurred to me that he's really only trying to be consistent. Um, he's just done so in the wrong direction. He said something to the effect of, if we fire this person for their homosexuality, then we need to fire those who are cohabitating together prior to marriage, those who are divorced and remarried, and all those who don't live up to the biblical standards. And it was a lengthy list of all of these um, shortcomings. And, uh, I, and I'm, so I'm, I'm paraphrasing what he said, but he mentioned these things specifically. And the thing is, as I read it, I find myself ag agreeing with him. I said, yeah, he's right. <laughs> we should do that. Um, but what he has done is said, since we don't confront these other sins, we, we need to exercise mercy and love with uh particularly homosexuals. He was just upset that we were targeting homosexuals. And that's, that is wrong in itself. We can't specifically just target homosexuals. We have to confront all sin, and we have to um, uh, not specifically target certain types of sins. So the faithful church of Christ does deal with sins. We, re, we re, uh, reprove, we rebuke, and we uh, exhort sinners to holiness. We excommunicate sinners who refuse to bend their knee to Christ, and we confess and repent of our sins as needed. And this reminds us of our own need to confess. So if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So come, let us worship and bow down. <clears throat> we live in a world which is increasingly degenerate, a world increasingly seeking to strike at her creator, a world increasingly attempting to deviate from the creator's order, the creator's reality, the creator's design. I haven't followed it closely, but I saw Rand Paul and a few others rightfully protesting the federal government's newest spending bill. That we are spending more than we're taking in, that we aren't cutting enough spending, that we are increasing the national debt, these are not new things. We've been spending more than we take in for years, although in the 90s I think we had a surplus for, for a few years under President Clinton uh, in a mostly Republican uh, Congress. But the general trend has been an ever-burgeoning welfare system, particularly Medicare and Medicaid. We fund a bloated military, and I can speak from experience that being in the military, there are people who are worthless, and there are jobs that are worthless, and it's a weird, it's almost a weird branch of welfare in, in the, that we're paying for. We fund uh, the military-industrial complex, um, seemingly pointless foreign wars, education, agriculture, urban development, science, the arts, on and on and on. The government is ever-increasing its scope of power in every area of life. We are $21 trillion in debt, and that number just continues to grow. Alexis de Tocqueville an incredibly perceptive and prophetic Frenchman came to America in the mid-19th century. He looked around, made observations, and he wrote them down in a hefty book called Democracy in America. And he imagined what America would be like in the future. And um, he imagined the good direction it could go and the bad direction it could go. 
and his imaginings of the bad direction is the direction we've gone. Um, so his imaginings of America in its worst form is like this. And I quote, Above the people, an immense tutelary, tutelary, I guess I don't know, tutelary power is elevated, which alone takes charge of assuring their enjoyments and watching over their fate. It is absolute, detailed, regular, far-seeing, and mild. It would resemble paternal power if, like that, it had for its object to prepare men for manhood. But on the contrary, it seeks only to keep them fixed irrevocably in childhood. It likes citizens to enjoy themselves, provided that they think only of enjoying themselves. It willingly works for their happiness, but it wants to be the sole agent and sole arbiter of that. It provides for their security, foresees and secures their needs, facilitates their pleasures, conducts their principal affairs, directs their industry, regulates their estates, divides their inheritance, can it not take away from them entirely the trouble of thinking and the pain of living? And that was written in 1840. And it's amazingly accurate, isn't it? It's almost scary to read. And it, because this is the world that we live in. This is what our government has become. Um... And really, what is this other than an attempt to erase Genesis 1 from our history? To pretend that God is not our creator, the giver of life, the ruler of all things. That people like Nancy Pelosi is our God, our giver of life. The one who makes proclamations, eschatological proclamations, that if we don't do certain things, people are going to die. These, these Armageddon types of things are reserved for God, and yet we have these people saying similar things. It's just a foolish notion. That the world exists for the benefits of the gods in Washington, D.C. That they alone know how to run the world, but more inefficiently than a free market. That they alone can grant us healing right after they steal money from our neighbors or borrow money from China. That they demand of us four times as much as God requires, but still be mind-blowingly inept and incompetent at spending it. And of course, we owe God our lives, but we also give him our tithe. And of course, Christ has told us to be obedient to the rulers and to give them what they require, and that we are to pray for our kings, and this is true and good. And that's why we pray for our civil magistrates often during our corporate prayer here at St. Athanasius. But we also should pray that our kings bend the knee to the creator, to the creator God of Genesis 1, instead of trying to be a God unto themselves. And of course, our leaders are just federal head representatives of who we are. We have the kinds of leaders that we deserve. Their desire to usurp God's throne is really just our desire to usurp God's throne. But it's not our throne to take. It's not our place. God created the world, therefore the world is God's and all that is in it. Render unto Caesar his taxes so that he can squander it. Render unto God your life so that he can bless it and multiply it. Caesar is a buffoon compared to our king. Where was Caesar when Christ laid the foundations of the world? Where was Chuck Schumer when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of glory, all the sons of God shouted for joy? Did Hillary Clinton cause light to shine out of darkness? Did Donald Trump cause the dawn to know its place? No, even our most magnanimous statesmen are specks of dust compared to our king, to our God, our creator. And our great statesmen are, are great because they acknowledge that we, uh, what we learned in Genesis 1, that we are creatures and not the creator. The good men who do rule, they humble themselves under the power of God, the God who made heaven and earth. They realize their place in the universe. And what we have now is a world raging against this fact, this reality. So we need to repent of our rebellion and live, or we'll perish. This is, this is uh, Genesis 1. This is what we have forgotten in Genesis 1. In Genesis 2, 
as I mentioned earlier, of Father James Martin, um, him defending the homosexual couple because the Catholic Church, at least in that area, was targeting them unfairly while ignoring the sins elsewhere. We see in Genesis 2 that uh, God makes man and woman indissolubly joined together. And so we can't ignore what God teaches in Genesis 2, particularly with divorce and remarriage, what Jesus taught him that. We read that God created Adam and gave him a wife and that they became one flesh. Jesus says this is why we stay married for life, because what God joins together, man cannot separate. And that this isn't just a suggestion or an ideal, like many conservative Christians now believe, but this is a law of physics, a law of reality. So that's Genesis 1 and 2, and then Genesis 3 and 4. We saw that our father Adam fell because he obeyed his wife and failed to protect her, and that his son Cain did the same because he obeyed his sin and failed to protect his brother, and that the sons of Cain increased in their wickedness and fell further away from the standards of the garden. And now here we are in Genesis 5 with a, a genealogy, not of the sons of Cain, like we saw in Genesis 4, but of the sons of Seth. And what, what is the deal with genealogies? When we get to genealogies in the Bible, I think it's safe to say that we all have a tendency to undervalue them and breeze by them, if not just skip them altogether. I've certainly been guilty of this. It's a long list of hard-to-pronounce names and more begots than we know what to do with. It's hard to see what the big deal is, but it is a big deal. And if we have a hard time understanding why, we're, why they're there, it is because of our limitations and not the Bible's. This goes for anything that seems strange or insignificant in Scripture. It's there for a reason. And if we don't understand it, that's our problem, not God's. The genealogies in the Bible really are monuments to our limitations. God in his providence, inspired his servants to write these things because they mattered, and he has ensured their preservation from antiquity to the present. So let me just briefly offer a few suggestions here as to why these genealogies are important. First, they help to prove a young earth. You have genealogies from Adam all the way to Christ, uh, Adam to Noah, uh, to Abraham, to David, and so on. And particularly with the oldest ones, like the ones we just read, it has the year spans in them. Now, you have genealogies in... I mentioned that because you have genealogies in Matthew and Mark, or in Matthew and Luke, uh, which skip generations. Um, but he specifically tells us, I think in Matthew, that he skips generations. Um, there's like, it breaks it into 14s. Um, so so the, I bring that up because old earth apologists will say, look, some of these genealogies skip generations. And with the ones in Matthew and Luke, you can say yes. But these ones, the old ones, the antediluvian ones, uh, the ones that preceded the flood, they don't skip generations. They may be selective in who they're choosing because it says this particular man had sons and daughters, but it says when he was this old, he begot this person. And then when that person was this old, he begot. So you're not, there's not gaps in the years there. Um, and so I think that that goes to show that goes all the way to Noah. And so in these, uh, these primitive genealogies we have, um, we have a young earth. And so uh, it's about, yeah, it's about 6,000 years old. Um, and that's not the only thing um, that affirms this, but it's certainly, a diff I have not encountered arguments that would invalidate uh, these, these genealogies as just reading them at face value. Um, 
there are interesting things going on with the names and the years, and uh, people can um, get very imaginative with them. And perhaps the authors did um, break up the years specifically in specifically to convey certain kinds of things, um, but it's all speculative and. Um, I think that I think that the easiest, the Occam's razor solution is to just read it at face value. So there's one example, and I'm not saying that the the author of Genesis wrote them um, keeping for the specific reason of being like we got to make sure that people in the year 2018 know that the Earth is young. That's not why they did it. It's not the principal reason, but I think it, it's an auxiliary reason or uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tangential reason, which has actually become pretty important now. So that's one reason. That's a, that's a helpful thing that genealogies provide for us. Another thing is they highlight the importance of uh, filial and paternal relations of sons and fathers, sonship and fatherhood. Adam is made in the image of God, and we're told in uh, uh, verse uh, 2, I believe, uh, that Seth is... I closed my Bible. Let me just check. Uh, verse 3. Yeah. So Adam, Adam lived, and he begot a son in his own likeness, and in his image. Adam created in God's uh, image Seth created in Adam's image. So Seth is made in the image of Adam, whose son you are matters. Are you a son of the serpent or are you a son of the woman? Luke gives us a genealogy from Christ to Adam where Adam is a son of God. It ends by saying Adam is a son of God. And so Christ is shown to be a second Adam. Luke traces it all the way back to Adam saying, look, here is one son of God, but now we have a new son of God coming and it's Christ. It was another son of God. The supreme example of how sons of God are supposed to live. Your actions show the world who your father is. And Christ was always regulated he uh, always regulating his actions in accordance with his father's will. So genealogies reinforce the importance of our relationship to our fathers, which points ultimately to our relationship with our heavenly father, our creator. Genealogies show who gets dominion, who gets the inheritance. Specifically, who gets the land? The land is a big deal all throughout the Old Testament. Um, and who gets the land? Well, it's the sons of Israel. Um, it's not the sons of Canaan. So, um, whose son you are determines the land that you are going to get, what you are going to inherit. Deuteronomy 5.33 says, You shall walk in the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live, and that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. Uh, so land is inherited based on family ties. If you descend from Canaan, you don't get the land. If you descend from Israel, you get the land. And if you descend from Christ, you get the earth. The meek will inherit the earth. Uh, Paul, I believe, writing to the Ephesians, uh, he he tells the children, he says, children, obey uh, your parents, your father and mother, so that it may go well with you in the earth or in the land. So he's writing to people who don't live in Palestine, and he's taking these, these covenantal promises which were given to um, old covenant Israel, and he's applying them to, to the Gentiles. So if you're a son of Christ, obey him, obey the covenant, and the land will be yours. The earth will be yours. So there's a dominion uh, element associated with genealogies. But the, here's the one that I want to talk about. And that's specifically about uh, antithesis. Antithesis. 
But before I get into that, I just want to say a, a couple things about um, a couple things about, and I mentioned it briefly already. But the the speculative element of Genesis five, there's there is a lot that is. Um, There's a lot of interesting things going on here, and they're, they're, it's all connected with the names and the years and the numbers, and there are lots of people who um, give really fanciful explanations for what's going on. Chuck Misler, he believed that all of the um, names basically encoded a message, and I can't even remember what the message was, but he changed the, me the, the obvious meanings or the more conventional meanings of the names to other things. And I'll, I'll, this is really technical, but I'll, I'll just say it really quickly because I think it's important to dispel these things because there's, I think there's a desire in us to want to believe that these things are there because it's really cool. I know I'm tempted to do this, but if you arrive there through bad um, interpretive methods, then it's... it's um, it's, it's wrong, and you, we, don't, we want to handle the Word of God with care. So one of the things that he does is he'll take the, the root word, and I think, um, I think uh, linguists call this, it's just the root fallacy, where most, um, he takes the root word of the names, which in Hebrew, most words are, they basically have three consonants, and, and then... Um, you fill in the, the vowels, but, and he'll take that root word and, and it depends, it matters what the vowels are. And so you can have a, a similar root word that means something totally different. And you can, I can give you an English example of this. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be a Hebrew example. And then take, take, take uh, the consonants BLT. Okay. Um, you, with those consonants, you can have the word built, bolt, um, blot. Um, I guess those are the three that I can think of right now. Built, bolt, blot. And there, I'm, sure there's, I'm sure there's others. Um, but all of those things mean very different things. Built is not the same thing as blot, which is not the same thing as bolt. And basically what he does is he says, look, this word has BLT in it, and it means built, or it's similar to this other word that means blot. And so he, so he does this quick, he does this switching of like, of the names in here, where their names mean something else, or they're just proper names. And he says, look, it, it's similar to this other word, which has a root um, that's similar, and and so he, he, he just arbitrarily chooses these other words in order to come up with a, a message. So people do this kind of thing all the time. There's another commentator who I, who is, I saw make a, a, a big deal out of the, the numbering convention for the years. And maybe there's something there. Um, I mean, there are those interesting things going on. I think Lamech lives... Yeah, Lamech lives 777 years. Well, that's interesting because the Lamech that's in Cain's line is the one who does the I'll be avenged 77 fold. So there is weird stuff like that going on. Um, but I think trying to... And then you have, you have a Canaan in here um, just as you had uh, a Cain earlier. And most likely that Canaan is... Uh, it, it could possibly be a, uh, just an extra N as a diminutive, which means it's kind of like a nickname. So there's lots of weird stuff going on. Um, so I just want to I just want to acknowledge that that stuff exists, and there there may be interesting things to pursue there. But um, I would just caution uh, to uh, to be careful with it, and to essentially um, know that most of this stuff is speculative, if not just outright uh, terrible. Um, uh, uh, interpretive methodology. All right, so got that out of the way. <clears throat> but I've, I've mentioned in previous sermons the antithesis between the seed of the woman 
and the seed of the serpent, the line of the godly and the line of the ungodly. And we have that in Genesis 5 here. Genesis 4 gives us a genealogy of the seed of the serpent, uh, the children of Cain. And Genesis 5 gives us a genealogy of the seed of the woman, the children of uh, Seth. From Cain issued wicked, God-hating men who only became more wicked. And from Seth issued righteous, God-fearing men. And I, I, should, I should qualify that because we're not specifically told that every person in the line of Seth was evil or every person in the line of Cain was evil. But when we do have uh, um, men in each of these li lines described, they uh, resemble their fathers. They resemble uh, wickedness, or, uh, the wickedness of their fathers, or they resemble the righteousness of their fathers. So um, that's why I'm, I, 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 I'm speaking in generalities here but for good reason. <clears throat> and I want to just zoom in on um, the, the seventh generation from Adam in the line of uh, Cain is Lamech, uh, and he's the first to break from the created order. We talked about this last week by taking two wives, Bigeny. Um, and he also boasts of his violence and vengeance and uh, the increased avenging on anyone who would kill him. And this is the kind of man, the city of man, the city of uh, Enoch produces. Conversely, and this is, this is what I want to talk about mostly with, this, with Seth's, line, Seth's line, the seventh generation from Adam in the line of Seth is another Enoch. So remember, Cain's son was Enoch, and he named the city after him. But in the seventh generation from Adam, you have Enoch. And he's a very different type of Enoch, almost uh, totally opposite of the kinds of men that we see in the city of Enoch. We're told that Enoch walked with God 300 years. Oh, uh, just from a uh, common sense perspective, walking with someone is a good thing. Um, it conveys relationship, there's some kind of closeness, enjoyment, friendship. You walk with your wife, you walk with your children, you walk with your friends, you talk with them, you communicate with them, you hold their hand, you put your arm around them, you get to know them. In Genesis 3, uh, God is walking not with Adam but alone. Adam uh, separates himself from God because of his sin and then God separates Adam from himself from the place he would walk. But we're told that Enoch walked with God. So in some sense, Enoch was restored back into fellowship with God. This godly line from Seth regained some kind of favor uh, from the Lord, while the line of Cain walked further from God by being exiled from Eden and creating a counterfeit Eden. Uh, the line of Seth walked closer to God. And uh, this terminology is throughout Scripture in Leviticus 26, 12, uh, when God is covenanting with the children of Israel. He says, I will walk among you and uh, will be your God and you will be my people. Uh, when Amos is uh, rebuking Israel, he rhetorically asks, uh, do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? So you're only going to walk with someone when you are in concert with them, when there is communication and agreement on where to meet and where to go. Another prophet, Micah, famously speaks about what the Lord requires of his people. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? So God desires us to walk humbly with him. This is what Enoch did. Enoch walked with God. And he pleased God so much so that God spared him from seeing death. Now, it doesn't say that in our passage. Moses doesn't specifically say that um, he avoided death. He just says that Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So we're not explicitly told that he didn't see death. But Paul tells us explicitly in his letter to the Hebrews, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Now, it's interesting that um, there's, there's a couple of interesting things about 
Enoch being taken. Um, the only other person to be taken by God in that way is Elijah, which this is Transfiguration Sunday, and he was he was there um, uh, when Jesus was transfigured um, along with Moses. So uh, you have Enoch and Elijah avoiding death and being taken by God. And this has caused some people, um, particularly in apologetic circles, you'll see them quote Jesus in John 3.13 when he's talking with Nicodemus. Um, and Jesus says, no one has ascended into heaven. And um, they just take that quote out of context and they say, yeah, no, people have ascended into he heaven. Enoch and Elijah ascended into heaven. So Jesus is contradicting um, Jesus is contradicting what the Bible teaches. And really, uh, there's, there's lots of explanations for what he means there, but I think if you just read the passage, what Jesus is saying, the main thing that he's saying there is that Jesus is actually from heaven. It's where he's resident, and he has more authority to speak than other people. Um, it's, it really has to do more with authority and what he knows than... Um, making a statement about uh, whether or not someone has been taken. So, uh, but there's other explanations out there. You feel free to. I just bring that up as a FYI. You can pursue that further on your own if you want. Now, it would be it would be nice to know more about what happened with Enoch, where he went, what he did while he was alive. The antediluvian world is mysterious. And uh, we aren't told a lot about it in Scripture. Um, I mean, we're about ready to enter into uh, the post-Diluvian world. Um, so, and we're only in, uh, we're in chapter 5. So we have five chapters of what the world was like prior to the flood. Um, and, but we do have one more further elaboration in Scripture of Enoch's life. And it's found in the Catholic epistle of Jude. Uh, Jude is considered a, a Catholic epistle. It's, it's labeled a Catholic epistle because it isn't addressed to anybody specifically. It's just addressed to the church in general. Um, so Jude, and this is another, it's, if you read, Jude is just a weird letter. But he's talking about apostates in the church. And he, make, he makes reference to them being marked out long ago. He likens uh, the wicked men who had crept into the church in the first century to the wicked men from all the ages in the past, from Cain to Korah. And it's kind, of, it's kind of a hard to understand passage, but he says this. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, in these men, in the context, he's talking about the men in the first century. So it's a bizarre thing, this antediluvian prophet is prophesying about these men um, in the first century. Saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them uh, of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Uh, this exact phrase is found in the book of Enoch. Um, so he's, he's citing this, this book of Enoch, which isn't canonized scripture. Um, but it's interesting nonetheless that Jude, Jude quotes it. Uh, and then here's, this is, try to follow me here. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is, I'm going to connect a lot of different points here. His description of the ungodly sinners of, in his comparison to similar, wait, wait, his description of the ungodly sinners is similar to the sinners in the past in Peter's warnings in 2 Peter 2, which makes reference to the time of Noah and the fact that God didn't spare the angels uh, who sinned. And Jude also mentions the angels who left their station. And Jesus says the end of the world in the first century, the end of that old covenant world, was going to be like the days of Noah. So basically what I'm saying is that Jude is making reference to evil people in the first century by comparing them to these 
these antediluvian sinners. Peter does the same thing. And Jesus talks about that time, is, and he compares it to the time of Noah. So basically, all of these people are saying, look, there's lots of similar things going on that happened prior to the flood. That's, that's, it's a stretch, and maybe that's not what's going on, but that's the common thread in all of these things that, that I'm seeing. Um, and... I think, and to tie up all of that in our passage, the new Lamech, the, the Lamech of Cain's line was this wicked man who wrote poetry. He wrote these songs about how, how he killed people and stuff, and, how he, and he had multiple wives. But the new Lamech in Seth's line, he gives birth to Noah. And he says of him, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Now, Noah's name means rest. So Noah will bring rest to these people. Noah is a type of Christ bringing salvation to his family and condemning the world. So similarly, to try to, try to wrap, uh, wrap all this up and, and tie it all together, those in the family of Christ will also be saved. From Noah comes Shem and Abraham and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and Moses and David and Elijah and ultimately Christ. And from Christ comes you. If you have been reborn into his family, if you have placed your faith in him and have been baptized, you are a son of God. You are part of Christ's family. And since you are a son of the ark builder of Christ, of the second Noah, and you have entered his ark, the church, you will be saved from the condemnation of the world. Noah means rest, and so does Christ, not in a literal sense, but Christ is our rest. Christ is our salvation, our land, our Sabbath. So, when we read genealogies in Scripture, it reminds us of our identity, our family, our roots, our origins, our place as sons and daughters of our Father in heaven. Hallowed be his name forever and ever. Amen. As one reborn into the heavenly family, you descend from the genealogy of the second Adam, Jesus, the Christ, our older brother, our father, our head, our husband, our lover, our savior, our Lord, and God. Therefore, go out into all the world, bringing those outside of our family into our family, teaching them, discipling them, conforming them more and more to resemble God. Therefore, truly being sons and daughters of God. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of, our glory, of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.